Pokemon X and Y are somehow almost 10 years old. Though widely adored, they're arguably the easiest games in the franchise. And the easiest to make fun of. In this video, I'm going to spice up my playthrough of Y just a bit and attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke using only one Pokemon. That means no items in battle, and no leveling up past the upcoming gym leader's highest level Pokemon. The only times I'll be allowed to use other Pokemon are against wild encounters, in order to farm items for example. Let's see how the run went. As is tradition, I named myself W and set out on my journey. Like with my previous one Pokemon Nuzlocke and Heart Gold, I must choose a Pokemon that can be found before the first gym. As I'm sure you've guessed by the thumbnail, I'll obviously be using Chespin, which I named Chester. Serena teaches everyone how to catch a Pokemon, and Shauna hints at the ineptitude of the rest of the rivals. Santaloon Forest is a breeze, and after a short trek through Route 3, I reach Santaloon City. My real encounter, Riolu, is found towards the end of the city on Route 22. Due to its measly 5% appearance rate, it takes a few minutes to find one. I catch it, and name it Aura Dude. Good natures, specifically the ones that drop special attack, will simplify certain portions of the game. The same goes for good IVs, though the only mandatory requirement is a speed IV of 23 or higher. While IVs would normally be randomized from 0 to 31, wild baby Pokemon like Riolu actually always start out with three perfect ones, making my life slightly easier. The only other requirement is having the ability Steadfast, which awards a speed boost upon flinching. Riolus have a 50% chance of possessing this ability, with Inner Focus covering the other 50. Since I don't want to replay through the entire start of a game whenever I roll bad natures, abilities, or stats, I'll be catching as many Riolus as I can before choosing which one to use. By the time I've exhausted 23 out of my 26 Pokeballs, I've obtained 11 Riolus. Aura Dude, Blue, Punch, Stone, Riolu, Cold, Steve Austin, John Cena, John Cena, and John Cena. Apologies, but I thought that was the peak of the nicknames. The last John Cena has Steadfast along with Anatomy Nature, which raises attack and drops special attack. It also appears to have perfect IVs in attack, defense, and special defense. The speed IV can be anywhere from 14 to 29, so I'll find out if it's good enough later in the run. Either way, this is one of the best Riolus I could have asked for. While I've amassed 11 fighters in Box 1, that's nowhere near as impressive as the number of fighters in today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends has over 700 champions, a fantastic RPG battle system, and challenging boss fights. If you want more specific reasons to play Raid, I'll just spell them out for you. R is for regular updates and content, as there's always new content arriving to Raid. A is for Arena, where you can pit your champions against players across the world, potentially awarding you medals to update your Great Hall. I is for impressive graphics, as Raid's graphics rival even those of PC games, and it's able to do this as a free mobile game. D is for dungeons, where you can battle terrifying bosses and obtain artifacts along with other resources. Even if mobile games aren't your thing, Raid Shadow Legends has premiered an animated limited series called Raid Call of the Arbiter, and the first episode is already out on YouTube. If they are your thing, you can find promo codes for Raid in each episode. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description or scan this QR code to get some crazy bonuses. I'm talking energy refills, magic potions, XP brews, and an epic champion, Kellen the Shrike. Raid Shadow Legends is a masterclass of a mobile game, so I hope you'll give it a try. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you on the battlefield. Following the Riolu hunt, I have to create a game plan against the first gym leader, Viola. The first thing I do is super train Riolu in attack and speed. Some other balloons were necessary to pop first, so Riolu got 12 EVs and the other 4 stats. I probably should have gotten Chespin to do that, but it's fine. Being able to max out a Pokemon's EVs this early is one reason why X and Y are considered to be comically easy. Even with the stat buffs though, Riolu won't be strong enough to take out Viola's Vivian, so I need a different Pokemon. This Pokemon? Lucario. Because Riolu's evolution occurs through friendship, I can actually get one as soon as one level later. So I skate back and forth in front of the Santaloon Poke Center and have Riolu punch the punching bag to get some bonus bags. There are 26 possible bags, with only two being useful to me for the rest of the run. The first of these is the Reset Bag, which can reset a Pokemon's EVs. I won't be using this one for a while though. The second of these bags is the Soothing Bag, which awards Riolu 20 points of friendship, a relatively large chunk of the end goal of 255. In combination with the roller skating, I get there pretty quickly. After changing the time to something after 9am, John Cena evolves into Lucario. It's always funny how Game Freak can't just use the actual names of the Pokemon for the pre-evolutions as well. Some kids somewhere definitely thought that Mightyena evolved from... Puppy. Definitely not me by the way. I've never made that mistake. Not once in my- For the record, I'm allowing Mega Evolution, but won't use it unless I feel like I absolutely need to in order to win a battle. Due to the surplus of experience points present in Kalos, staying under the level cap will eventually be pretty difficult. 
This makes avoiding optional trainers really important. To help me with this, I imitated a lot of PulseFX's routing in his Pokemon X speedrun 5 years ago. I'll be referencing that run a few times in the future as well. There are no moves that Lucario can learn for a while, so I just bring it up to level 11 and challenge Viola. Viola's first Pokemon is Surskit with the moves Bubble, Quick Attack, and Water Sport. Ideally, I want Lucario's Quick Attack to deal under 50% to Surskit, so Viola can burn her potion on her weaker Pokemon the following turn. Unfortunately, it doesn't do this, and Surskit faints to the next Quick Attack. Lucario deals about 20%, then Vivian uses Harden to raise its defense. Infestation only deals 1 damage, but deals damage equal to 1 8th of the target's HP for 5 turns, meaning that it'll eventually take out 20 of Lucario's hit points over the next several turns. If Lucario was level 12, it would have had enough hit points for Infestation's residual damage to be 5 a turn instead of 4. After trading a few more attacks, Viola uses her potion, and 4 quick attacks later, Lucario takes out Vivian with 9 HP remaining. Viola's sister gives me the EXP share, which in previous generations would let other party members absorb some of the EXP that Lucario gains after each battle. However, in this gen, the Pokémon that participates in battle still gains 100% of the EXP, while the rest of the party would gain 50%. So if your party was full, your team would be getting 350% of the EXP a Pokémon would normally get by itself. Another reason why these games are so easy. I head north onto Route 4 and receive the TM for Return, a normal type move possessing a base power of 102 if the user's friendship is maxed out. Something smells broken. In Lumio City, I meet Professor Sycamore and battle him. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the first instance of being able to battle a professor other than the Professor Oak hidden battle back in Generation 1. Return, which replaced Quick Attack, takes out all three of Sycamore's Kanto starters. I choose Charmander as my prize. Ominous music plays when encountering Lysander, and he talks about ending the world. Foreshadowing. Another Lucario gives me a nod of respect before I continue through Route 5, and then I've got to battle Tierno. At least he actually tried. Unlike this dude. Coward. Comment your favorite rival below. Or least favorite. Or anything really. Comments are good for the algorithm. Because I have only one Pokemon in the party, I don't have to participate in this double battle, conserving some room for experience. In my playthrough of Pokemon Y without taking damage, I complained extensively about being unable to control the roller skates, to which about 80 of you commented that I could use the D-pad instead to walk or run normally. Thanks to you guys, I've been using the D-pad frequently during this run, and the better control has been beneficial, especially considering how many trainers I've had to dodge. I reach Camprier Town, and do almost nothing there. Game Freak put some solid detail into the sleeping Snorlax, as you can actually see it breathe. To wake it up, I head over to Parfum Palace in order to obtain the Pokey Flute. But first, photo time. Remarkable. The palace owner reveals himself to be a snob, then hands over the flute. I mean, gets his butler to hand over the flute. The butler also gifts the TM for Protect. Next up is the multi-battle teaming up with Serena against Tierno and Trevor. While Return is destroying everything, Lucario learns Power Up Punch, a 40 base power fighting type move that raises the user's attack by one stage. After a little bit more traveling, I reach Route 8, and Amber Town soon after. Rhyhorn takes me to Glittering Cave, where I have my first encounter with Team Flare. Team Flare grunts are… not… the best. The double battle teaming up with Serena could have been annoying, but given that Krogunk has no fighting type moves and Scraggy has zero IVs to pair with an attack dropping nature, I was likely in no danger anyways. I grab the TM for Shadow Claw and head back towards Amber Town. I get the TM for Rock Smash along with the Old Rod before heading out towards Sillage City. I can buy Dust Balls here, which will guarantee that I catch my next encounter. There's an entrance to Connecting Cave at the east of the city, and I pick up a Zubat after running around for a while. I name it Air Cutter. I grab a bike before I forget, and am ready to take on the second gym leader, Grant. Because there weren't any mandatory trainers inside the gym, my Lucario appears to be severely underleveled. However, it is still a Lucario. Power Up Punch being 4 times super effective, one shot Zamora. Tyrant survives, but does nothing with a critical hit Rock Tomb. That's the Cliff Badge along with the TM for Rock Tomb. North of Sillage City is Route 10, which leads to Geosenge Town. In Geosenge Town, I'll have to fight two level 25 Lucarios, with each one possessing a speed stat of 60. At level 19, my Lucario's speed stat is only 55. I'll probably need two or three more levels to outspeed, but after a couple mandatory Team Flare fights, my Lucario hits level 21, and a speed stat of 61. No third level is necessary, and John Cena's speed IV is confirmed to be 24 or 25. So this run is looking good. Power Up Punch isn't guaranteed to KO either of Karina's Lucarios even at plus 2 attack, so I need to find a different strategy. I find a Soft Sand in Geosenge Town, and then head back to Lumio City. I teach Chest and Cut, Rock Smash and Strength, the last of which creates a shortcut to Route 7. There sure are 3 towns and 4 routes between the first and second gym. 
After reaching Lumio City again, I head to the Pokemart to purchase the TMs for Sword Stance and Bulldoze, which are 10,000 each. I currently have only a sixth of that, and this is what happens when you avoid trainers. I sell basically all of my unnecessary items and scrounge up just enough cash to purchase both TMs. Thanks to that picture I took in front of Parfum Palace, I can grab the wide lens from a backpacker inside one of the Lumios cafes. While heading back to Geocinch Town, I make a pit stop in Sillage City to train up Air Cutter until it learns Air Cutter. As I mentioned in the beginning of the run, Lucario is only necessary for trainer battles. After level 22, Zubat starts gaining boosted EXP for some reason. I didn't know why at the time, but apparently Pokemon that are past their evolution level will gain boosted experience in Generation 6. I'm unsure if this feature is in current games. At level 26, Zubat learns Air Cutter and evolves into Golbat. I think it's time that I reveal the purpose of this side quest. Karina's gym has a ton of powerful fighting types, several of which can KO my Lucario with one super effective hit. There exist single-use berries that can have super effective damage, but the way you get them in this game is pretty convoluted. Natural objects are an X and Y specific feature that can appear during wild battles. For example, when fishing on the beach, you can find sand piles along with pink berry trees and red berry trees, for some reason. To break sand piles, you can use moves like Hyper Voice and Rock Slide, awarding you a soft sand or stardust at the end of the battle. In the case of trees, Blizzard, Twister, and Air Cutter will cause berries to fall. One of the six berries that can drop from the red berry tree is a Choppel Berry, which has super effective fighting type damage. After about 45 minutes, I finally obtained a Choppel Berry. Those 45 minutes weren't fruitless, as I got Persian Berries, which heal confusion, and some Cherry Berries, which heal paralysis. The only tutorials on YouTube for this berry involved using Surf, or were just way later in the game, so I was pretty excited to see I could obtain one this early. I still need a few more, but getting the rest of them is pretty easy. The berry fields are south of Route 7. After planting the berry, watering it a few times, and pulling out some weeds, I grabbed six Choppel Berries. This fetch quest is officially over, and that pit stop was more like a two month long hotel stay. Before battling Karina, I teach Lucario Bulldoze over return, and give it the soft sand, which boosts the power of ground type moves by 20%. Both of our Lucarios end up using Sword Stance on turn one, so this battle should be in the bag now. Bulldoze knocks out both of Karina's Pokemon with one hit each. I box Golbat, carefully tread through Reflection Cave, and arrive at Shallower City. To prove myself worthy for Mega Evolution, I have to battle Serena in the Tower of Mastery. Serena's first Pokemon is Meowstic, which uses Fake Out, flinching Lucario. However, Lucario has the ability Steadfast, which raises speed in response to a flinch. Meowstic doesn't have anything too powerful to hit Lucario, so I set up one Swords Dance. I taught Lucario Shadow Claw to help with the fight in Reflection Cave, but forgot to change it back to Return before this fight. It KOs Meowstic, but falls short of Breaks In. Breakson only has Fire Spin and Psybeam, so I should have been fine either way, though I could have given Lucario a Persian Berry to cover for Psybeam's Confusion Chance. Power Up Punch KOs Zabzal to win the battle. I enter Karina's gym, and here's where the run gets incredibly tough. All four gym trainers are mandatory, though the silver lining is that I can battle them in any order. I first battle Roller Skater Kate, who leads with Metatite. Swords Dance is safe, as the Choppel Berry neutralizes in power fighting. Return KOs Metatite and Mianfu. Next up is Roller Skater Rolanda, who has a Sock without Sturdy and a Hariyama without Fighting-type moves. Sword Stance is again safe, and Sock hits Lucario with Low Sweep, which drops its speed. This Sock has a speed-dropping nature though, so Lucario is still faster. Return KO Sock, and deals almost 90% to Hariyama. Hariyama's Belly Drum fails, and it falls to power-up punch the next turn. Skater Shun is next, and has three Pokémon, starting with Pancham. It has Circle Throw, a 60 base power attack which would normally switch Lucario out. That effect won't occur, however, thanks to only having one Pokémon. In the worst case scenario, Lucario should survive two Circle Throws, accounting for one Choppelberry activation. Opposing AIs aren't perfect yet, apparently, since Pancham goes for a resisted Slash. After a second Sword Stance, Pancham uses Comet Punch, another resisted attack. Power Up Punch KOs Pancham, while plus 5 return KOs Throw and Machoke. Lucario wants to learn Bone Rush, but I don't have room for it since I need Counter for the next battle. The last trainer has just one Pokemon, a level 30 Heracross. It has Brick Break, Takedown, Counter, and Chip Away. We both mulligan turns 1 and 2 by using counters, but Heracross goes for Chip Away on the third, letting my counter deal a solid chunk of damage back. Two returns can KO Heracross from this range, but I use Sword Stance because I don't want to be hit by counter. Heracross again decides to not use its super effective move, and Return picks up the knockout on the next turn. Karina has a Mianfu, Machoke, and Halucha the last of which has a speed stat of 87, so it's a bit faster than Lucario. While devising a strategy, I realized that Lucario's attack is just barely not enough to guarantee a KO on Halucha with a plus 3 return, so those tutorial Eevees at the beginning of the game were somehow actually relevant. 
It's time to use my first reset bag to delete all 510 EVs. After some time, I max out Lucario's speed and attack. Karina's first Pokemon is a Mianfu with the moves Fake Out, Power Up Punch, and Double Slap. It uses Fake Out to give me a speed boost on turn 1, meaning that I will now outspeed Halucha. Sword Stance doubles Lucario's attack, and it takes a Power Up Punch very comfortably thanks to the Choppleberry. One Power Up Punch of its own KOs Mianfu. Return KOs Halucha and Machoke to win the battle. If you recall the fight against Grant, Lucario reached level 19 at the end of the battle, 6 under the cap. However, at the end of this battle, it's at level 30, just 2 under the cap. Considering the next two caps are 34 and 37, this run isn't looking promising at the moment. While scaling the Tower of Mastery, I received the TM for Low Sweep, a situational upgrade to Power Up Punch. The third battle with the third Gym Leader commences at the top of the tower, though I'm using a different Lucario on this occasion. This Lucario is always hasty with a maxed out speed IV, so there's almost no chance to lose this battle. Barring a crit. My Lucario's Power Up Punch does 75%, and Karina's leaves me with just 12 HP. My Lucario wins the next turn, and I win the Lucario, naming it Emergency. Its only perfect IV is speed, so it is objectively worse than my current Lucario in every single way. If the level cap ever becomes a problem, I'll just use it for a couple of barely relevant battles to sink some experience. It's going in the box for now though. I purchase the TMs for Dig and Poison Jab, then receive a Lapras to help me cross some water. Believe it or not, riding Skiddo is necessary to avoid battling trainers on this route. In Comarine City, Serena wants to battle again, so I make sure to give my Lucario a Persimberry this time. After getting another speed boost, Sword Stance doubles my attack, and Meowstic's disarming voice deals almost nothing. Return somehow doesn't KO Meowstic, but it goes for Light Screen, which basically doubles its team's special defense for 5 turns, which is irrelevant here. Power Up Punch removes the remainder of Meowstic's HP. Return KOs breaks in, while Power Up Punch takes out Absol. I'm still only at level 31, so staying under this gym's cap will definitely be doable. After defeating the three mandatory gym trainers, I challenge Ramos. He leads off with Jump Luff and starts the battle with Leech Seed. I'll be able to survive a critical hit acrobatics from this range, so I can safely set up another Sword Stance. A plus 4 return KOs Jump Luff, Go Goat, and Weep and Bell to win me the Plant Badge, but now I'm almost at level 35. With 15 mandatory trainers preceding the next gym leader, there's unfortunately no way I can stay behind level 38. So I take Emergency out of the box, increase its friendship, and replace Metal Sound with Return. First up is the Kalos Power Plant, which has been infested by Team Flare. I set Golbat as my lead Pokemon en route towards the plant, since Trap Inch and Dugtrio can ambush me. These Pokemon have the ability Arena Trap, which prevents all Pokemon except Ghost and Flying types from fleeing. At the Power Plant, there are 11 Team Flare members, none of which I can skip for some reason. I just cycle between several different sets to beat them. Dig helps with poison types like Swallowed and Krogunk, Return coupled with a Person Berry lets me beat Golbat without being confused, and Low Sweep can take out Mightyena, Scraggy, and Lightbard. By the time all 9 grunts have been defeated, my backup Lucario has gained 4.5 levels. Emergency tags in John Cena to fight the Team Flare admin and Scientist. The admin, doing his best Pitbull impression, has 1 level 36 Houndoom, while the Scientist, Aliana, has 1 level 38 Mightyena, higher than the cap. Low Sweep KOs Houndoom in one hit, and Mightyena in two due to Intimidate lowering Lucario's attack. Pop quiz, what is this duo's team name? If you guessed the Defenders of Kalos, you would unfortunately be correct. Immediately after reaching Lumio City, I hit the gym and run through four trainers, falling just short of level 37 by the end. So maybe I could have battled two or three of the nine grunts with this Lucario. Clement is probably the toughest gym leader yet, as he has an Amolga with Static and a Magneton with Sturdy. If I had battled that Heracross trainer first in Karina's gym, I could have taught Lucario the multi-hit ground move Bone Rush, which would have taken out Magneton in one hit. Really tough oversight, but there's no way to relearn the move at this point in the game. I reset Lucario's EVs again, dumping a lot into special defense so it can survive a Bolt Switch from Amolga coupled with a critical hit from Magneton's Thunderbolt. On Route 5, I skillfully dodge several trainers and slide on a few grind rails to obtain the TM for Hone Claws, which raises both accuracy and attack by one stage each. This is like playing the world's hardest game, but easier. Before battling Clement, I give Lucario the Cherry Berry, which heals Paralysis. I also teach it Rock Tomb and Hone Claws. I think I have less than a 1 in 256 chance of losing this battle, so I'm feeling pretty good. Lucario gets one Hone Claws up, and takes about a quarter of its health from Aerial Ace. Rock Tomb, which is now 100% accurate, KOs Amolga the next turn. Lucario levels up and learns Me First over Counter. Me First is a move that uses an opponent's upcoming move with 1.5 times the power. It could be situationally useful. Clement sends out Magneton next. 
Glow Sweep brings it down to 30, while Thunderbolt takes out a little more than half of Lucario's remaining HP. A few more Low Sweeps are necessary due to Clement's Hyper Potion, but Magneton never gets to move again. Low Sweep knocks out Heliolisk, earning me the Voltage Badge. Team Flare is in front of this extremely red cafe Lysander is in. More foreshadowing. He goes on a rant and gives me a King's Ruck because he talked too much. If you've been enjoying this video, please consider subscribing, as there's no better way to support the channel. I'm so close to reaching that 20k, and only 2.3% of my viewers are actually subscribed at the moment. I reset my EVs back to a simple max max spread, then leave Lumios to enter Route 14. There is a battle against Serena here, but it's no more difficult than any of the previous ones. She does have a Delphox now though. A couple of plus 2 Shadow Claws KO Meowstic and Delphox, while a low sweep takes out Absol. Golbat took about 3 more gyms than Lucario to become friendly enough, but it finally evolves into Crobat. I find a cleanse tag on the route, and read its description. Sounds like a permanent repel as long as you give it to your lead Pokemon. So I give it to Lucario, and run into a Pokemon after one step. Truly a scam. Laver City is next, as is the 6th gym. I teach Lucario Bulldoze and Poison Jab. Bulldoze is better than Dig here, since Valerie's Mawile can get a free iron defense on the turn Lucario is underground. She doesn't have a single attack that isn't not very effective though, so I set up one Sword Stance as Mawile doubles its defense with Iron Defense. Two Bulldozes knock it out from there. Poison Jab KOs Mr. Mime and Sylveon to win the battle. Another Team Flare event awaits at the Pokeball Factory. There are several grunts present throughout the area, but unlike in the Power Plant, exactly zero of them are mandatory. The admin here has a Scraggy and Houndoom, but both fall to Low Sweep. There's also a double battle against a couple scientists, Solosia and Brioni. I've played this game nearly four times and still do not know who is who. They have a Manectric and Lightbard, but Lightbard only has attacks that Lucario resists, while Manectric can only attack off of its weaker attacking stat. Dig KOs Manectric, and Lightbard faints to Low Sweep. After reaching Dendemil Town, I sprint to Frost Cavern. It's pretty annoying to get through, and is littered with several optional trainers, some of which can be run killing. Watching Pulse Effects' speedrun was particularly useful here, as there was this one really obscure maneuver involving skating across ice diagonally. I teach Lucario Return to deal with the Grunt preceding Scientist Mabel. A plus 2 return takes out the Grunt's Golbat and Manectric, but Lucario gets paralyzed in the process. There is a gap to heal before fighting the Scientist though, so I do that and challenge Mabel. This Houndoom is 7 levels higher, but still fades to low sweep. Mamoswine trudges its way through Route 17 and ends up running into a Delibird. I've seen Iron Bundle way too many times over the past 6 months thanks to Scarlet and Violet, so there was some whiplash upon seeing this sprite. I reach Anastor City a bit later, and fly back to Comarine City to obtain the Silk Scarf, which boosts normal type attacks by 20%. I give that item to Lucario before battling Serena for a fourth time. Lucario sets up a Sword Stance and takes Meowstic's Shadow Ball comfortably. The AI is actually terrible. There's no reason for it to use an 80 base power Ghost move over a 90 base power Stab Psychic move. Return KOs Meowstic, Dig takes out Delphox, and a couple more returns take out both Jolteon and Absol. Before battling the most forgettable gym leader in Pokemon, I fly to Lumio City and enter one of the buildings. I accidentally went to the second floor instead of the third, and end up witnessing the creepy ghost girl scene for the first time. I honestly had never seen that easter egg in a playthrough of mine before, and also had no idea it was in this building. On the third floor I get the Expert Belt, which boosts the power of super effective attacks by 20%. I give Lucario the Expert Belt, and teach it Shadow Claw over Dig. Olympia uses Psychic types, and leads off with Sigilith. Sigilyph will either use Reflect or Light Screen, which, for a period of 5 turns, will basically double the party's defense or special defense, respectively. I set up one Sword Stance as it uses Light Screen, which does nothing to help Olympia's team. Shadow Claw 1 hit KO Sigilyph, Sloking, and Meowstic. If Reflect was set up, I would have had to use one more Sword Stance. Lysander sends a message by Holocaster that he's about to kill anyone and anything except for Team Flare members. This takes surrounding yourself with Yes Men to a whole new level. I fly back to Lumios, then force a couple grunts to give me Lysander's lab location, password information, and social security number. Lysander will likely be my toughest opponent yet. Two apparent concerns with this team are a Mianfu with high jump kick and Gyarados with earthquake. However, the real problem is that his Pyroar has a speed boosting nature and will outspeed Lucario. This means I have to give it the Lucario Knight for the first time in the run. The best way to solving the Mianfu issue is through Protect. The drawback to High Jump Kick and its 130 base power is that it'll take out half of the user's health if it misses, hits into an immune Pokemon, or hits into a Protect. Lucaria's moveset will be Power Up Punch, Return, Protect, and Sword Stance. Something a little amusing is that Lucario's middling HP IV means Mianfu will always KO the Mega Form using High Jump Kick, as opposed to an 87.5% chance if the IV were perfect. Although it may have either way, now I'm certain the AI will use High Jump Kick on the first turn. 
Lucario protects, and Mianfu gives me 50% of its health for free. A Power Up Punch takes Mianfu out, and brings Lucario to plus one. Here's a tongue twister for you. The Power Up Power Up Punch was boosted by Adaptability, an ability that boosts the stab modifier from 1.5 times to 2. So fighting in Steel type moves will deal about 33% more damage than usual. Pyroar is part normal type, so Lucario gets another boost from Power Up Punch. Lysander sends out Gyarados, which drops Lucario's attack by one stage. I'm about to take my biggest risk of the run up until this point. I need Return to get a critical hit, or Gyarados' Earthquake to not get a critical hit. That's about a 94% chance. Return doesn't crit, but Earthquake doesn't either. Return takes out Gyarados on the following turn. Lysander's Murkrow doesn't have Sucker Punch, so I can safely click Return again to win me the battle. There's nothing notable in the rest of Lysander Labs, besides the fact that Mabel's Houndoom lost two levels somehow. Zerosic activates the ultimate weapon, which puts the world on a timer. If you think about it, and I mean, really think about it, Zerosic is basically evil Clement. The future is dead, thanks to science. I fly to Stillage City and head south onto Route 8 to pick up a heart scale. I offer this heart scale to the Move Reminder in Dendemil Town so that Lucario can learn close combat. A 120 base power stab move is undoubtedly the best attack Lucario's had to work with. In Geosench Town, I reach each Lucario power up punch and protect, then invade the Team Flare hideout. Apologies, the Team Flare secret headquarters. Lysander cries to make us feel bad for him and then challenges me to a battle. The gaps between the levels of his Pokemon and Lucario's have closed, but not enough for me to avoid taking the same risk as the last fight. The first, second, and third turns play out the exact same way, with Mianxiao and Pyroar fainting to power up punch. Gyarados' Intimidate brings Lucario down to one stage of boosted attack. Accounting for the resisted hit, Close Combat is functionally a 120 base power move with adaptability, while Return is just 102 base power. Even with that increase, CC can only KO 50% of the time. This potential KO is only confirmed when Lucario is level 53, which would have put me in danger of passing the next cap. Return does about 85%, and I need Gyarados to not crit me again. Doesn't happen, and Power Up Punch removes the remainder of Gyarados' HP. Close Combat takes out Honchkrow, and Lysander is down again. The next three battles are double battles teaming up with Serena, but only the last set of opponents are actually threatening. The final two trainers have a Scrafty with High Jump Kick and a Houndoom with Flamethrower. Fortunately, the Scrafty has no IVs and an attack lowering nature, so High Jump Kick has no chance of KOing through a Choppleberry even with a critical hit. Low Sweep KOs Houndoom, Meowstic deals some chip damage with Disarming Voice, and Scrafty uses Scary Face to have Lucario's speed. I'm still faster, and Low Sweep removes the remainder of Scrafty's HP. I run through four admins in a row and prepare for the final battle against Lysander. I need to fill up my party first, so I add Chester, Charmander, and Steve. I fly to Shallow City next and enter Reflection Cave. I grab the Black Belt, which boosts fighting type attacks by 20%. Lucario's moveset will be Power Up Punch, Close Combat, Low Sweep, and Protect. It'll also be holding the Black Belt. Yveltal breaks out of its cocoon, so I put it back in another one called the Master Ball. If my party wasn't full, I would have been forced to add Yveltal to my party rather than send it to the bots. If it enters your party, it will always be the first Pokemon sent out, which obviously won't be allowed. Lysander enters the field looking like Doc Ock and sends out Mianxiao. Protect does the same thing as always, and Power of Punch KOs Mianxiao the next turn thanks to the additional power from the Black Belt. Unfortunately, I have to deal with all the weak Pokemon in my party leveling up a ton. Charmander did not learn Bubble. Lysander sends out Pyroar, and a plus one low sweep takes it out. For the record, Lysander's Pokemon natures change between each battle, so Pyro didn't have a speed boosting nature in this one. Since Mega Pokemon are always sent out last, Honchkrow arrives a bit early. A plus one close combat easily knocks it out, leaving Gyarados. Gyarados' Mega Evolution causes it to switch out its flying type for Dark, making it weak to fighting type moves. Ironically, the one Lysander battle I didn't have to Mega Evolve in was the one where he did. I'm able to save Chespin from a Dark Fate, but not Lysander. I speed through Route 18 and reach Coraway Town, where Professor Sycamore wants to battle using his fully evolved Kanto starters. Venusaur doesn't have anything to stop Lucario from setting up though. Two sword stances allow return to KO Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise. Shauna, Tierno, and Trevor are absolute pushovers on their own, but not when they challenge you consecutively. Shauna has a Greninja with Water Shuriken, which is generally a weak move but will always go first. Damage in this battle carries over to Tierno's, who has a Talonflame with Flame Body, an ability that burns upon contact 30% of the time. Trevor heals you up before his battle, but he has a Raichu with Static, an ability that paralyzes upon contact 30% of the time. I'm not sure I can cover for all of these, but I'll at least farm some Cherry Berries given that I'll likely need a couple later in the run. I settle on a moveset of Rock Tomb, Close Combat, Return, and Swords Dance. Shauna's up first, and sends out a Delcaddy. 
I don't want to have to use close combat on Gudra, so I use Swords Dance at the cost of a little bit of damage taken from Play Rough. Return knocks out Delcaddy and Gudra, and Close Combat knocks out Greninja. Water Shuriken wouldn't have done too much anyways, but I'm fortunate that it wasn't used. Tierno is second and leads with Talonflame. Rock Tomb is only 95% accurate without the Wide Lens, but the Talonflame doesn't actually have any fire type moves and can only deal a maximum of 61 damage with acrobatics. A miss from this Rock Tomb could have potentially ended the run. Tierno sends out his Crawdont. Close Combat knocks it out, but lowers Lucario's defenses before he can face Roserade. It has exactly one move to hit Lucario, Petal Dance. And I mean that literally, it can't use anything else. Return won't KO, but Petal Dance won't either from this range, even with a crit. If Greninja had used Water Shuriken, I would have just had Lucario use Swords Dance against Talonflame, and then Rock Tomb. Trevor is last and heals Lucario to make this an unfair fight. Raichu's up first, but I have to set up for the Florgis and Aerodactyl in the back, so I use Swords Dance. Nuzzle paralyzes me for all but two seconds. Unfortunately, this means that I have to hit yet another 95% accurate Rock Tomb to avoid the static risk. It hits, so this battle is over. A plus two return KOs Florgis, and a plus two close combat KOs Aerodactyl. I think I could have solved a few of my problems by using Hone Claws over Sword Stance, or getting the TM for Brick Break and replacing Close Combat with it. In the Hone Claws instance though, Raichu wouldn't have fainted to a plus one Rock Tomb. All's well that ends well, but I probably lose there 10 to 15% of the time. The gym leader of Snowbell City is in another castle, so I have to head through a physics defying forest to fetch him. Both. Both of these, in any ways, after taking on all four gym trainers, Lucario falls just short of the level cap of 59. Wolfric's ice types stand no chance. I give Lucario an Aspir Berry to heal a potential Ice Beam Freeze and start the battle. Sword Stance is completely safe, and Abomasnow uses Ice Beam, validating my item choice. Low Sweep KOs both Abomasnow and Cryogonal, while Close Combat fells Avalug. The final gym badge is mine, and I can start going through Victory Road. Getting through it is pretty easy until the final five trainers, starting with Serena. Okay, maybe just the final four trainers. I can't wait to get Chespin out of the party. I can only keep doing this for so long. The first tough trainer, veteran Gerard, has a Banette and Leafy on. Banette has Thunder Wave, so I have Lucario hold a Cherry Berry. However, I forgot to change the moveset before the battle and entered it in without Shadow Claw. Lucario uses Sword Stance as Banette uses Thunder Wave, activating the Cherry Berry. Thankfully, Dig is still guaranteed to KO Banette. Close Combat takes out Leafy on, leaving three more vets. The next one, Veteran Tameo, is the toughest. He has a Trevenant with the moves Shadow Claw, Will-O-Wisp, Woodhammer, and Curse. Will-O-Wisp will burn Lucario, having its attack while sapping 1 8th of its HP a turn. Curse will take out 1 4th of Lucario's HP per turn, at the cost of half of Trevenant's HP. I watched several speedruns while preparing for this fight, and Curse was used 10 times out of 11, Wisp being the only other click to move. Somehow, 4 of the 15 runs that I watched had their own Lucario Shadow Claw just crit, so I guess the lesson here is that skilled people get lucky. Anyways, what this tells me is that Trevenant is almost definitely using Curse. My own Shadow Claw won't pick up a 1 at KO, no matter what Lucario is holding, meaning Trevenant will always get an attack off. And even when it does go down, a Gigalith with the ability Sturdy takes its place, meaning another two attacks are needed. Gigalith also has Earthquake, which will deal about 80% or more of Lucario's health. So how do I get out of this one? I probably spent about one hour theorying different strategies, but eventually come up with a solution that covers for even the worst case scenario. I fly to Dendemil Town, head west onto Route 15, and enter the Lost Hotel. All the way to the left is a roller skater, who tosses me the TM for fling. You can guess where this is headed. Earlier this run, Lysander gifted me a King's Rock in his cafe in Lumio City. When you fling a King's Rock, the opposing Pokemon takes a small amount of damage, and then always flinches. I give Lucario the King's Rock, then teach it fling and Shadow Claw. Moment of truth. I have Lucario use Sword Stance to cancel out a potential Will-O-Wisp. Trevenant goes for Curse, and Lucario loses 25% of its health. Shadow Claw finishes off Trevenant, but the Curse rages on. Gigalith actually has Protect, which would nullify Fling if used. It won't use it though, since it sees a KO with Earthquake. Fling chips Gigalith and causes it to flinch, allowing Close Combat to end the battle the following turn. So in conclusion, I only won this battle because Lysander said too many words. The last two battles are pretty easy, though I did need to level up Lucario once to outspeed the final trainer's Alakazam. I finally arrive at the Pokemon League and start to prepare for the Elite Four. After training Lucario up until the point where it's about to surpass the level cap, I locate the TM for Earthquake close to the Chamber of Emptiness on Route 22, and the TM for Stone Edge along a riverbank near the entrance of Frost Cavern. I box my remaining Pokemon, and it's time for the usual team recap. John Cena the Lucario is level 65 and holding a Cherry Berry. It has the moves Shadow Claw, Close Combat, Return, and Sword Stance. 
I plan to battle Drasna and her dragon types first, but her Noivern has a speed stat of 179, one more than my Lucario's. KOing just one of her Pokémon will level up Lucario, so this isn't actually an issue. Noivern was the primary reason I needed Lucario to have a high speed IV. Drasna leads off with Dragalge, which will either use Surf or Thunderbolt. Lucario sets up one Swords Dance, as Dragalge uses Surf. After the second Swords Dance, it uses Thunderbolt, but I don't have to worry about Paralysis thanks to the Cherry Berry. Return KOs Dragalge, and out comes Noivern. Lucario has a speed stat of 181, so it outspeeds and knocks out Noivern with another return. Drodagon and Altaria meet similar fates, so that's one Elite Four member down. Wickstrom is next. I switch out Lucario's Swords Dance for Power Up Punch, and return for Earthquake. I also swap the Cherry Berry for an Expert Belt. Wickstrom leads with Klefki, which will either use Dazzling Gleam or Torment. Torment is a move that will stop Lucario from using the same move twice in a row. This can make dealing with some of the Pokémon in the back a bit difficult. Klefki indeed uses Torment, and an Expert Belt boosted Earthquake KOs it. Wickstrom sends out his Probopass, which has the ability Sturdy. Power Punch activates Sturdy, but Probopass lends a critical hit Earth Power to bring Lucario down to 42 HP. Wickstrom has a priority move in the back, so this is pretty bad. He heals as I use Earthquake to activate Sturdy again. Probopass won't make a move for the rest of the battle, so all I need to do is make sure Earthquake does not deal the finishing blow. So after another heal and a second Power Up Punch, Shadow Claw KOs Probopass. Now for what could have been the problem Pokémon, Aegislash. Both Shadow Claw and Earthquake do enough damage at plus 2 attack, but Aegislash has a move called King's Shield. This is basically a protect that drops the attacker's attack stat by two stages if they make contact with a move like Shadow Claw. Earthquake doesn't make that contact though. If King's Shield blocks Earthquake on the first turn, then I can just Shadow Claw to take Aegislash out on the next one. Scizor has a 40 base power move that always goes first, Bullet Punch. This move gets boosted by 50% thanks to Stab, and an additional 50% thanks to Scizor's ability, Technician. But thanks to being not very effective, it will never deal more than 38 damage to Lucario, barring a crit. The AI doesn't account for crits, so it'll use the non-priority Iron Head instead, a move that actually does KO Lucario. Close Combat deletes Scizor to win the battle. Before the next battle, I replace Earthquake with Stone Edge and Power Up Punch with Swords Dance. Notice that Lucario's speed stat is 183, which would speed tie Malva's Talonflame. To hit level 68 in time, I need to battle Seabold first. His lead Pokémon has a small chance to KO me in one hit though, so I need to reset my EVs again. I feel like this might be breaking some unwritten rule, but I really don't want to take an unnecessary risk. Lucario basically swaps out 28 of its attack EVs for special defense. I give Lucario the Wide Lens and then challenge the Gordon Ramsay of Kalos. He even rages like him too. Seabold leads off with Clawitzer, which has an 80 base power fighting type special move, Aurasphere. Clawitzer's ability, Mega Launcher, boosts the power of this move by an additional 50%. I can't cover for a critical hit, but Lucario's EVs will always allow it to survive Aurasphere normally. Lucario sets up a sword stance and Aurasphere leaves it with 30 HP. Close combat knocks out Clawitzer, but Gyarados gets sent out next, dropping Lucario's attack. The only move I have access to that can KO Gyarados at plus 1 is the 80% accurate Stone Edge. Thanks to the Wide Lens, the accuracy increases to 88%. I click Stone Edge, it hits, and the rest of the battle should be easy. Close Combat eliminates Barbarical, and Shadow Claw tears through Starmie, allowing Lucario to reach level 68 by the end of the battle. I replace Stone Edge with Earthquake, Shadow Claw with Rock Tomb, and Sword Stance with Low Sweep. Malva leads off with Pyroar, and during turn 1, I realize that Earthquake's 100 base power is stronger than Low Sweep's 97.5, stab included. So that was a useless move choice. Earthquake knocks out Pyroar, and Talonflame comes out. A 100% accurate Rock Tomb fells it. Torkoal is next, and will only either use Earthquake or Curse. I can just fire an EQ of my own, which does almost 90%, then Torkoal uses Curse to raise its attack and defense. Melva heals up, and another EQ does a bit more than 50%. If Lucario wasn't adamant, Torkoal might have been able to get a plus one attack off. One final Earthquake KOs Chandelier to win the battle. I give Lucario the Megastone and switch around my moves a bit before fighting Diantha. I initially exchange Rock Tomb for Shadow Claw, return for Earthquake, and Low Sweep for Sword Stance, but realize that I want Earthquake again due to Diantha's Rock types. Shadow Claw and its 70 base power are strong enough at plus 2 attack to pick off Diantha's lead Pokémon, Halucha, so return isn't actually necessary. I burn my final reset bag in order to cover for some critical hits. I add just enough speed EVs for Lucario to outspeed Diantha's team in Mega Form, max out its attack, and dump the rest into HP. Diantha's team consists of 5 Kalos Pokémon and a Mega Gardevoir. She leads off with Halucha as I lead off with my juiced Lucario. The purpose of the HP, which honestly should have just gone straight to defense, was to allow Lucario to comfortably survive a flying press critical hit from Halucha. It goes for Sword Stance anyways, which I match later in the turn. 
Since Mega Pokemon speed stats only update the turn after Mega Evolving, Lucario moves first and KOs Halucha with Shadow Claw. Gudra is next and gets knocked out by Earthquake. The two fossils of this generation meet the same fate, then Diantha sends out Gorgeist. Gorgeist has a 40 base power priority move, Shadow Sneak, but thanks to the extra bulk, likely would not have KO'd Lucario even if Halucha had crit flying press. Gardevoir Mega evolves, John Cena uses Shadow Claw, and that's the champion. There's also the AZ fight if it counts, but an adaptability boosted close combat and two Shadow Claws destroy his team. With that, I have officially beaten a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Y with just one Pokemon. Well, technically two, but we don't talk about that. My final in-game time is 20 hours and 38 minutes. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment for the algorithm. Also, check out my insanely twisted hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black if you're interested. Thanks for watching.